Okay, so what we saw last time was how we take the, the naive definition of a group and sort of give it a, a categorical flavour. So what is a group? Well, the way we've, we've, we've decided to describe it um, is it's an object in the category of set, so it's a set together with certain uh, morphisms. So we've got the multiplication, the identity, which we've, instead of thinking of this as an element of the group, it's now a morphism from the, the terminal object in the category of sets uh, to our group, and uh, inverse, which are called gamma. Uh, so we've got three morphisms, we've got an object, three morphisms, and satisfying certain axioms, the, the usual axioms, so associativity, unit, and inverse. So well, if we just kind of step back a second, if, if we remove the inverse uh, morphism and the inverse axiom, then what we've got is something you can find in any monoidal category, which is a monoid. So something satisfied uh, with a product and a unit, and satisfying the associativity and unit axioms, that's just a monoid. Uh, and so we can happily define that in any monoidal category, as we'll, we'll see in a bit. But what we have here is this inverse is going to cause us a slight amount of problems, because to actually define the axiom for the inverse, what we need is these two extra bits of data, uh, which are delta and epsilon. So these come for free uh, in the category of sets because, uh, as I explained, we've got the categorical product as our tensor product. So cross is a product in the categorical sense, so we automatically get this diagonal map for free. This is a, satisfies a certain universal property, and we get this map to the terminal object, this sort of unique, unique uh, thing there, and so with this bit of data we can then define the inverses. So this definition is not going to work in general for monoidal categories, but it is going to work for Cartesian categories, that's categories, monoidal categories, whose monoidal product is the categorical product. So, so let's just, uh, so what, what I'm saying is we can just take this definition now, if you give me a Cartesian category, then we can just take this definition and say what it means to have a group object in such a thing. So let, so let me just write down the first five uh, Cartesian categories that spring to mind. Uh, okay, so which ones can you think of? So I can think of, well, the one I've written down there, which is the category of sets. Um, I can think of top, the category of topological spaces. So the product is just the usual Cartesian products of spaces. I can think of smooth manifolds. Um, I can also, uh, what's another one? Oh, the category of groups and the category of categories. Now, in each of these cases, I can tell you what it means to be a group object. So it's just gonna, I'm just going to replace um, sets by whatever the category is. Here, these are Cartesian categories, so we automatically get for free these two morphisms, and uh, we can understand what a group object is. So, so, what is it? so what's a group object in set? Well, I've already told you what that is. Uh, it's an unpleasant little line. So a group object in here is just, is just a group. Uh, a group object in topological spaces, so that just comes down to a topological group. So, you can just, that's, so it's just a topological space with a product such that the product, uh, sorry, and an inverse and a unit such that all the morphisms are continuous. So this is a topological group. Do the same thing in the category of manifolds. Through manifolds, we get a Lie group. Uh, so that's sort of the obvious one. So slightly more interesting what goes on with the category of groups. A group object in the category of groups. Well, what's that going to turn out to be? So it's clearly going to be a group with possibly some more stuff. So when you when you actually sit down and figure it out, it's by rather bizarrely, it isn't a group with extra stuff. It's 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 sort of a group with less stuff almost. But well, anyway, I'll, uh, I'll explain what I mean by this. So, turns out it's just an abelian group. Um, so it's got to be a group with a product from the Cartesian product of the group to itself, which is a group homomorphism between these two things. Um, and it turns out that that just means this has to be the product in the group and that that has to be commutative. Um, 
so we end up with an abelian group. So I'll, I'll leave you to, to work out the details of that. So a category of categories, a group object in there, is something which um, arises in various contexts. I, I guess I'll just call it a, a, a cross module. Um, it's also a categorical, it's also a category in the category of groups, but uh, that's not of much interest to us at the moment. Um, it's just a, a, a different example of a group object in a Cartesian category. So, so these are nice Cartesian categories, but we often want to consider things that look like groups in monoidal categories which aren't Cartesian. And the big problem is we don't have this stuff around. I'll explain a, a little bit why we want to look at these next time, but we don't have these two things around. So we have to, um, we have to sort of work around not having these, and we'll see uh, how we do that next time. So what I, I'd like to do this time is just explain uh, an example of a monoidal category which isn't Cartesian. So let me get rid of this now. So the simplest example of a monoidal category which isn't Cartesian is one which is very familiar to many of you, I suspect. It's just a category of vector spaces. So just for simplicity, I'm going to take uh, that to be the category of uh, vector spaces, finite dimensional vector spaces. Over the complex numbers. So we have a tensor product. So we have a tensor product and we have the unit, um, the unit object, which will turn out just to be uh, the complex numbers. So what is the tensor product? So the, the crunch is, what, what is uh, how is this thing defined? So if we have two finite dimensional vector spaces, V and W, we define the tensor product in the following way. So what, what do we do? We take all formal linear combinations of uh, of a vector in V tensored with a, a well together with a vector in W. So let's let's just find this. so we're going to take some summation, some finite summation of some linear multiple. So that's just a scalar of V T tensor W. So that's just a symbol, uh, something in, in V and something in W and just a scalar. So that's in C that's in V. And modulo, whoops, so we just take the set of those, modulo the certain relations, and the relations just say that if we have um, alpha 1 times v1 plus alpha 2 times v2 tensored with w, that is equivalent to um, alpha 1 v1 tensor w plus alpha 2 v2 tensor w and, uh, and, the other, and the one the other way around plus uh, v tensor uh, linear combinations of w's is equivalent to v tensor whatever plus v tensor whatever and that's uh, just the, the symmetric one the other way around which I won't write down so that's the, de the definition. Now, what, what you can kind of see very quickly is how to get a basis of V tensor W. So if, if suppose we had a basis VI for V, and let's say WJ is a basis for W, then VI tensor WJ is a basis Cleanly written it down. Um, then we get that VI tensor WJ. Uh, you can quite easily see from the definition there, uh, just a couple of lines of calculation, is a basis for V tensor W. So, what's the, the sort of corollary of that? Well, I mean, um, oh, just say what I've got to say very quickly. So the, the point is that the dimension of V tensor W is equal to the dimension of V times the dimension of W. Uh, but that's not the same as the Cartesian product. So the Cartesian product or the direct sum uh, satisfies uh, V cross W. I mean, the dimension is 
is the sum. So the corollary is that the tensor product is not the Cartesian product. So this is a category, who, a monoidal category, which is not Cartesian. So we'll say more about this next time.